Good morning. Special welcome to our guests and visitors. I don't know about you, but boy, today I am thankful. What am I thankful for? I'm thankful for air conditioning. Especially uh, since my office is not air conditioning. Let's just say Friday I wrote, uh, I wrote today's sermon from home. Because it's a little hot to work when you're warm under the collar. Um, I'm also thankful for this woman sitting behind the organ today for Dr. Robin Gale. She's filling in for Megan, and if Megan, if my memory serves me correctly, Megan and Dan, I believe, are celebrating their anniversary uh, this weekend. So thank you, Dr. Gale, for being back with us once again. And speaking of our service, if we, 
if you would be so kind as to turn with me in your bulletin to page 5. As we slowly return to a semblance of normalcy, here as we have to learn to live with COVID, um, today we are reintroducing the procession of the cross. So you'll notice there above the gathering hymn. So what does that mean for you? At that stage of the service, please rise and face the rear of the sanctuary. And then as our crucifer brings the cross forward, just follow him uh, with your eyes and with your feet. Well, with that, let us begin this service. Please rise as we do so. And we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. I invite you to kneel as you're able. the grace of God unto all of you. And in the said, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you make us both to will and to do those things that are good and acceptable in your sight. Let your fatherly hand ever guide us and your Holy Spirit ever be with us to direct us in the knowledge and obedience of your word that we may obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The first lesson is taken from Genesis 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready, quickly, three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Then they said, to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? who may abide upon your holy hill. Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit 
upon a neighbor. In their sight the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. The second reading is from Colossians. Colossians, the first book of Colossians. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing all evil things. He has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death so that to present present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, excuse me, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke, the tenth chapter. Now, as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you. 
Well, this morning I want to pick up where we left off. As you know, or most of you hopefully know, for this month and for next month, we'll be turning our attention to the Psalms. I'll be preaching from that ancient prayer book of the Bible. And I don't know about you, but boy, do I need these old, old prayers. I need them both personally, but I also need them as your pastor. And I was given a vivid reminder of this Wednesday morning. I went downtown, I went to Regions Hospital, and I checked on Randy Leela. Randy had had his prostate removed uh, the day before. He was doing so well, he was going home that afternoon. But since I was in the building, I decided to pay a quick visit to Steve Thompson. Steve's recovering there at Regions Hospital. He was the victim of a horrendous act of road rage here recently. Ten of his ribs were broken. Now, when I had visited Steve last Sunday evening, he seemed to be on the way to mending. But when I visited him Wednesday, just before lunch, the lunch hour, Steve was moaning and groaning and wincing in pain. So we didn't chit-chat, of course. There was not an opportunity for small talk, not with him in such excruciating pain. So I just opened my Bible, and I began to read to him for a few minutes from the Psalms. The Psalms are without compare, and when it comes to teaching us how to live by faith in the trials and the tribulations and the temptations that come our way, there's no better devotional book that we can turn to. And as we dig deeper into the Psalms, before we go any further, I need to warn you. If you spend much time at all in these ancient prayers, they will confuse, they will frustrate, and they will even shock you. Let me give you just two examples of what I mean. Consider this verse from Psalm 3. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, strike all my enemies on the jaw, and break the teeth of the wicked. What, what is going on here? What is this kind of a prayer doing in the Bible? Oh, it gets worse. It gets more graphic. Listen to the final two verses of Psalm 137. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. This language shocks, shocks us as it should. What is this doing in the Bible? Taking a little infant, taking a baby and dashing its head against the rocks? Well, let's not forget when we gather this morning that the God we've come to worship is a God of vengeance as well as a God of mercy. Because I can easily imagine at this very hour, there might be a mother in the Ukraine who is crying out to heaven above. She might be crying out to the Lord Almighty for retribution, for vengeance, for the slaughter of her children. Human nature hasn't changed all that much, has it? And with this introduction, with those few brief remarks, we turn our attention to today's psalm. And I, for one, I find Psalm 15 to be very disturbing, to be very disturbing for me personally. What about you? Oh, we said those words together just moments ago, but did they sink in? And what thoughts went through your minds as we read these words together? Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose way is blameless, who does what is right, who speaks the truth from his heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slurs on others, who despises a vile person 
but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and doesn't change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. And whoever does these things, whoever does all of these things, will never be shaken. Good words, but demanding words, and the demands of Psalm 15, they overwhelm me. Frankly, they scare me, and they should scare you as well. Why is that? Because my walk this past week, it hasn't been blameless. How about you? I've broken God's holy and righteous law, and I've done it in thought, word, and deed. And I've not let God's love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. How about you? Well, I imagine that we're in the same sinking and stinking boat. We're not blameless. We're not righteous. The truth be told, the opposite is the case. We're sin-filled. We're unholy. We should be shaking in sheer terror, just as did God's people of old, Isaiah being today's prime example. He writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, and he was seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And terrified, terrified, Isaiah goes on to cry out. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And woe is me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord, the Almighty. Isaiah was scared to death. He felt this way because he knew the word of his Lord. He knew what the Almighty had declared. Centuries earlier, Moses had begged and pleaded with the Lord to reveal his glory to him. And the Lord responded, You can't see my face. No one can see me and live. Why is that? Sinners cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. The holy God, we're reminded time and time again in Scripture, is a consuming fire. Look at what happened to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at what happened to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They all perished. They all perished when the judgment of God descended, fell on them. And Isaiah, he was sure that he was next. He was sure that he was about to suffer their fate. Woe is me, he cried. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Well, what about us? Here we stand or sit in the presence of the Almighty. And what's going to happen that day when we stand before the Lord Almighty. What's going to happen when we meet our maker face to face? We can't ignore, and I can't downplay the clear word of God. We need to take to heart what God's people have long known, an uncomfortable truth. Listen now to what Paul had to say to the first believers in the Greek city of Corinth. He wrote to them, don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
So we're back where we started. Who, who will dwell in the end in God's sanctuary? Well, the answer of Scripture is clear. Only the pure, only the spotless, only the blameless. What hope then do we have when it's our turn to meet the maker of heaven and earth? Our only hope is in the one who reached out to Isaiah with nothing less than pure mercy. Isaiah writes what happened next then. On that day he saw the Lord. Then one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me with a live coal in his hand. He had taken it with tongs from the altar. And he used it and he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And are you ready to believe it or not? Something similar has happened to each and every one of us here, I imagine. Because Paul didn't stop there when he was writing to the Corinthians. He had this good news to share. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And that leads to a question. Well, when did this happen to you and to me? It happened to us that day that we were baptized, and in our baptism, our sins were washed away. In our baptism, we were clothed with the righteousness of Christ himself. And if that were not enough, today, the same Lord who graciously reached out to Isaiah and who healed and cured and purified his unclean lips is going to do something similar to the likes of you and me. We will receive the very body and the very blood of our Savior. We will do so with our own two lips. And in doing so, we will receive once again the free and full pardon for our sins. Well, let me go back to our sermon text, to Psalm 15. And let's take another look at those opening two questions. Lord, who, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? Only those who are blameless, only those who are righteous, only those who are pure, only those who are holy. And where does that leave the likes of you and me? It leaves us here this morning desperate, as always, desperate for Christ. It leaves us desperate today, once again, for a Savior, for our Savior. And it leaves us clinging to this precious promise, this wonderful word of our Lord. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, Luther, he thought long and hard about this passage and similar ones, and he ended up calling it the blessed exchange, and Luther wrote about this. He has made his righteousness my righteousness, and my sin his sin. If he has made my sin to be his sin, then I don't have it, and I am free if he has made my righteousness, if he has made his righteousness my righteousness, then I am righteous now with the same righteousness as he. And elsewhere, our namesake, he put it this way, is not this a beautiful, glorious exchange by which Christ, who is wholly innocent and holy, not only takes upon himself another sin, that is my sin, my guilt, but also clothes and adorns me, who am nothing but sin, with his own innocence and purity. And then besides, dies the shameful death of the cross for the sake of my sins, through which I have deserved death and condemnation, and he grants to me his righteousness in order that I might live with him eternally, in glorious and unspeakable joy. This is the blessed exchange, Luther goes on to write, 
in which Christ changes places with us. And it's something that only the heart can grasp by faith. And through nothing else are we freed from sin and death and given his righteousness and life as our own. O oh Christ, today we remember, we remembered in a visual way as the cross was once again brought forward. Christ climbed that holy mount that we call Calvary, and there he died the most unholy of deaths. He was strung up between two sinners for all the world to see, and he did so for the likes of you and for me. And Christ is our sure and certain hope, both in life and and in death. And we stand here today, I assure you, pure and spotless. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the world, all of ours included. And because this is most certainly true, we can now honestly and confidently confess Psalm 15 and make those words our own. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, and who does no wrong to his neighbor and casts no slurs on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and doesn't change their mind, and who lends money to the poor without interest, and who doesn't accept a bribe against the innocent, and whoever does these things, and our Lord and Savior has done them for us, will never be shaken. Amen.
sit in that last line of that last stanza, sum it up. We're here to adore. We're here to believe. I invite you to join me now by rising, and we will confess our faith doing so using the Apostles' Creed. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. As we continue with the prayer of the church, we will be including a special petition for healing for Steve Thompson. For Brian Boyd, who continues to recover uh, in transitional care from a stroke. For Randy Leela, home now after his surgery. And for John and Lorraine Jurgens, who are still recovering and coping with COVID. I invite you to kneel as we continue for prayer. Let us call on the Lord our God. O oh God, keep us steadfast in the one true Christian faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Fix your eyes on Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Protect us from all error and false teaching. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Deliver all who are caught up in false belief or disbelief. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lead all to acknowledge their sin and their need for salvation. Lord, in your mercy, help all pastors to teach the truth that we are lost in our sin and that we can in no way save ourselves. Rather, our hope is in Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy, transform us by the renewing of our minds that we would no longer conform to the pattern of this world. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and sustain the sick, the injured, including Steve, Brian, Randy, John, and Lorraine. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Jesus. Amen. Oh God, help us to follow Jesus all of our days. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Jesus. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. 
For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. To the Lord our God. It is right to give our and It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.
we continue with our post-communion prayer. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to him, to his, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Once again, before closing the service, I want to thank Dr. Gale for filling in for us as our musician this morning. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.